Um, morning, everybody. I uh, start the next session on uh, dialogue in diabetic eye diseases. I please invite uh, Rish Talwar, panelists, Dr. Dhanashri Rathra and Dr. Anand Rajendran on stage, please. Can I uh, request Dr. Talwar, sir? Dr. Talwar is speaking on uh, decoding dilemmas in DME management in India. So, we'll have Dr. Talwar speak first on uh, DME management, decoding dilemmas in that. Following that, we'll have uh, Dr. Thanashi Ratra ma'am speak on her experience with anti age in PDR. That should all, both should be interesting. We'll have both talks one by one, we, then we'll have a discussion on uh, panel discussion. Uh, Dr. Talwar, sir. <coughs> Thank you, Saurabh. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are all you, we are all treating diabetic macular edema over here. And we all have issues regarding that management. Some that we talk about all the time, some that are there at the back of our mind, we don't talk about them. This is my disclaimer and my financial disclosure. Mike, please, over here. This is not very loud. Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. Now, among the issues which exist regarding management of diabetic macular edema, the first one concerns the genesis of the edema. Then we'll talk about the dilemmas we face as treating physicians. And then we'll discuss whether it's possible to predict the response to the treatment that we are taking. Now, you see, diabetic macular edema is not just a straightforward disease. If you see from this, there are multiple pathways by which diabetes affects the eye and results in the loss of the, um, the, capilla the uh, uh, capillary autoregulation and causes a vascular dis dysfunction. And then you end up with macular edema. And it's it's something that goes beyond just an in increase in VEGF levels. And the root cause is hyperglycemia, which needs to be addressed if we are really looking to improve our patients on a long-term basis. Um, it's not just blood glucose, but it's also the blood pressure, the, uh, the, uh, the lipid control. And we all know this, but the question is, do we give it enough importance? The other important issues in today's era of anti-VEGFs, everyone says lasers are obsolete. Are they? Well, the, this myth came from this study, uh, both the Restore and DRCR Net I, which said that, look, the patients who had anti-VEGF with laser had slightly lower visual results, visual outcomes, as compared to the ones who had a deferred laser. But we'll come to that. And remember, there are patients whom you have who have center involving diabetic macular edema, but the origin of that leak is way beyond the foveal center, and they are easily amenable to laser. And in both the protocol I and DRCR net uh, and the restore, uh, it, there were enough cases, almost 50%, who had a possibility of being lasered. Now, does every laser work equally well? The one thing that you come across is that if you see, do a subgroup analysis, the diffuse diabetic macular edema when lasered, the vision outcomes dropped. On the other hand, in, that means you're giving anti-VEGF and you add to that a, a macular grid, the chances are your vision will drop. But if you've done a focal macular laser, Actually, there is no difference in the outcome. So if you have that worsening, it's not because of laser. Laser is being condemned unnecessarily. It is the type of laser that you've done. The other important thing is that could peripheral CNP also be contributing to, um, uh, to the non-responders among the DME group? And one of the biggest studies we have is the protocol S itself, where they found that in patients who had DME, if you compared the monotherapy group, they got in the first year nine injections compared to the group which had combination of PRP with anti-VEGF and they needed only half the number. In two years, the figure drops from 14 to nine. So keep it in mind, is it possible that PRP would decrease the need of anti-VEGF treatment in DME in patients who are non-responders? So in patients who are non-responders, keep this in mind. Which anti-VEGF 
to use when we will discuss now the how to use them the first thing is is there a need to say hey, hey get this injection done quickly there's an emergency there is no emergency if you see the uh, these studies you find even a delay of one year did made no difference to overall outcomes at the end of three years if the prn treatment was started after one year but when this treatment was started two years later then there was a a deficit which could not be covered so keep in mind the treatment the window of opportunity is at least an year so don't push your patients into emergency like situations which are not control their diabetes control their lipid profile start the treatment the other important drug about what drug to use well the, the initial reports came a flibosep was definitely the best uh, others were not comparable but as time went by you find that the results of aflibosep came a little down those of ranibizumab came a little up and finally by the end of five years even in patients who have poor vision there is not much of a difference between those who, who are treated with aflibosep and those who are treated with ranibizumab the other important thing is that what about those in who have good vision patients who, go, who have good vision it says makes no difference which anti-vegf you use and that is exactly the fact that in terms of visual outcomes all the three drugs are fully good now the other important thing is there is a role for persisting with treatment is the is the person who persists who gets the reward not the person who just makes the first shot so intensive anti-vegf treatment at from initiation is important to get the best visual outcomes and that is applicable to all the anti-vegf drugs but regardless of which drug you use if you persist with it you will get better results now the other important thing is that in in patients who we said in terms of visual outcome they were similar when there both aflibosept and ranibizumab were equal in terms of the reduction of the central subfield foveal thickness as compared to bevacizumab so please bevacizumab is not as good as ranibizumab but if you don't have an alternative if the patient says this is the only thing i can afford then it's better to give him something rather than nothing in patients who have this severe uh, macular edema and lower vision that means vision less than 612 and uh, a foveal thickness of up to 400 micron both have flibosept and ranibizumab are equally good though in patients who have higher uh, cst than that a flibosept is definitely better than bevacizumab and um, better than uh, ranibizumab but not but not statistically different the other important thing and this is very relevant to our country you want to improve your results add laser this is the all the drugs are all the drugs are equally good you are able to add laser to your treatment this can make the uh, suboptimal results so if you want to break out of the dilemmas that you patients who have a visual equity better than or equal to 12 my suggestion would be if both ranibizumab and aflibosept are equally good patients whose vision is less than 16 but but the um, foveal thickness is less than 400 micron again ranibizumab is stuck to you when it comes to patients who have a thickness more than 400 micron initiate treatment with aflibosept and then shift to ranibizumab and i will explain to you how it down the course and finally if you combine all these treatments with focal macular laser not the grid you can improve your results further and decrease the number of injections if you persist with the treatment the number of injections goes down over the years this fortunately for us unlike armd is a finite disease a disease in which the number of injections drops by half by the second year further by the third year and at least 50 to 60 percent of your patients will not need treatment after that so it's very important tell the patient the carrot is 
the, the stick is you need urgent, uh, you need treatment regularly. The carrot is you take this treatment regularly and the treatment will become over. The last important thing, can you prognosticate? The best prognostic is not one OCT change or the other which are all controversial but the most important is a therapeutic indicator. You give three injections of ranibizumab and the patient becomes all right, you know this patient is going to have a great result over the whole year. Patients who respond by month three or four actually have a need for less injections around average of 4.3 and at least two line improvement by the end of the year. So that is your best prognostic indicator and you can tell the patient by the end of three injections, I can tell you how you are doing with this treatment. The other important thing is, what about chronic persistent DNA? And there are patients, almost 30-40% who will be like that. Even in these patients, if you persist with treatment, and that's why I am highlighting this, we give up, give up too soon. Don't give up on the disease, on the patient. Continue and you will get the results. Even these patients, number of percentage have chronic persistent decreases from around 40% initially down to 50% um, at the end of take the whole quad uh, of patients. But the ones who have persistent ME do not get as good vision as the ones who had. That's some, something that makes sense. Now, those patients who don't do well after the first three injections, why say 12 weeks? Find they had less than five letter improvement, and that even with a flibercept is 25% of the patients. That in mind, these patients, when they are treated with either a flibercept or ranibizumab in the, both the group, to find at the end of two years, there's almost it's as if well, they are either equal or at least in the study, the, the ranibizumab group did slightly better, not statistically significant but slightly better. So the point is that it's important that just because initial gains were not there, not that only a flibercept will work. Ranibizumab can work equally well even in those. that in mind. And you see this over here, that the percentage of patients who got more than 10 letters was high, in fact highest ranibizumab group of the two protocol team. What about economic issues? Most important, ultimately, that's the deciding factor. Now, fortunately for us, we have an era of biosimilars, we have an era of patient support. But together, the costs are coming down. Other important thing, they have a patient support program even for centrics, where you have a two plus one scheme. Actually, if you look at it, at least in our center, effectively means that the patient's cost for the biosimilar and for centrics virtually working out to be the same. And if you look at Fibercept, that complete program of five injections actually ends up with one injection less. So in the initiation phase, if you need to start with a Fibercept, you can do that. But in the maintenance phase, it may be served better for your with your patient by then shifting out to the patient support program of eccentrics. So it's important to choose the right patient support program at the right time also. So ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, First, want to your patients to well, systemic control must be initiated early and continued for the long term. Both ranibizumab and aflibercept have a similar reduction in uh, patients who are better than 12. Patients who have less than 6, uh, CST of less than 400 micron, aflibercept and ranibizumab are similar in combination of ranibizumab with focal laser can give you as good results as monotherapy. Except most important thing, clinical outcomes with anti-VEGF during ranibizumab can be sustained for five years, the substantial reduction in injection frequency over time. Today, cost issues are no longer a deterrent to the use of any drug, including all the innovator drugs. Keep it in mind that you have suboptimal responders maybe want better than ranibizumab or at least as well as a percept. One doesn't need to a percept. That's it. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We'll quickly um, move on to the next uh, our next speaker, Dr. Dhanashri Ratra. Um, I'm 
uh, I would like to thank VRSI and uh, Novartis for this opportunity. And I'm going to talk to you today about my experience with anti-VHF in proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And uh, I have no financial interest and this is a disclaimer from Novartis. Uh, so we know that diabetes is a major disease burden in our country and what is more important to know that one in every six diabetics in the world is an Indian, which is a really a frightening uh, statistics if you can calculate the number. And uh, most of this, if you look at the, uh, the amount of proliferative diabetic retinopathy in these diabetic patients, it nearly amounts to about 17 to 20 percent. So that increases the burden of diabetic retinopathy uh, way, too, way too high. And it's also seen that the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy is much higher in Indians as compared to the other Asians. So we know that the gold standard of uh, treatment for proliferative diabetic retinopathy is panretinal photocoagulation. But we also know and in fact, these are points to ponder that nearly 40% of PDR patients do not respond properly to PRP. Nearly one third of these patients have a recurrence of neovascularization even after a good PRP. And nearly about 40% develop vitreous hemorrhage soon after the PRP. I mean, so much so that most of the patients blame the laser for the vitreous hemorrhage. So, uh, and then we keep adding more fill-in PRP to stop those uh, neovascularization and vitreous hemorrhage. And this is what it ends up, that the entire retina is, uh, you know, destroyed by the laser, but for the small central uh, island, that affects the field of view uh, drastically and patient has probably only tubular fields like this. So, we need to see, think that is it time for change now? Do we, can we do something else? Can we prevent this? So, the rationale for use for uh, anti-VHF and what is the role of anti-VHF in PDR? So we know that anti-VHF agents are, uh, have a potential to prevent recurrences. They can lead to uh, the decrease in the diabetic retinopathy severity and they can reduce the neovascular process at the same time maintaining the integrity of the retina and it will ultimately have a beneficial result in maintaining uh, and preserving vision. So what are the clinical scenarios in which you can add anti-VHF in a PDR patient? So of course you can add it with PDR with the center involving DME. But you can also add uh, anti-VEGF in active PDR along with uh, PRP. You can also have PDR with uh, uh, either neovascularization of the iris or NVG. And in PDR after vitrectomy where there is recurrent vitreous hemorrhage. And also in a few cases uh, very judiciously you can use uh, anti-VEGF in uh, treatment naive cases of PDR where there is uh, no traction and there is a good compliance of the patient. So let us look at these clinical scenarios one by one. PDR with center involving DME. These are some few representative cases. This is a 45 year old male with a, a PDR, lot of capillary non-perfusion and also macular edema. So PRP was done as, a, as per our pretreatment protocol and two doses of anti vegf were given which resulted in good control of the macular edema. Uh, when we have active PDR along with PRP, so le let us look at this young uh, uh, boy, 30 year old man. Uh, with uncontrolled diabetes who presented with a large NVD in both eyes. Look at the size of the NVD in both eyes. So immediately prompt laser was done, PRP was done, but the NVD seemed to be persisting in both eyes. So again we did another round of fill-in PRP and now, now there is also some hemorrhage along with that. So I was really concerned for this young boy and so we decided, I decided to add anti vegf for this. So one dose of anti vegf there is some reduction in the NVD but uh, still it is persisting. So finally second dose was given and uh, this is actually after the third dose there was a finally good reduction of NVD, maintained the, uh, the retina is maintained, no hemorrhage and good, good outcome. So this is what uh, I would like to stress that uh, along with anti vegf it can give good outcome. This is another patient, a 53 year old male. Again you see the NVD which persists even after PRP and this I am talking about 3-4 months down the line after PRP, not immediately after PRP. So due time is given for regression but even then it persists so you can add one anti vegf and it can result in good regression. When you have PDR with no traction but and patient is likely to be compliant you must inform the patient about the need for, for complete follow up and this is a patient uh, with a similar uh, disease where there was a small NVE along with uh, of course di diabetic macular edema and this I am treating with regular doses of anti vegf the, no laser has been done so far and he is doing good the, the NVE is regressed well. Uh, of course, you know that uh, PDR with NVI or NVG are uh, prime uh, good candidates for anti vegf because anti vegf in just single dose leads to good regression of the NVI or NVG and can help especially if the angle is open. And if you have uh, a vitrectomized patient who has a recurrent vitreous hemorrhage, we know that 85% of these patients have a fibrovascular proliferation related to the sclerotomy site and they do well with an anti vegf injection. You can also add vitreous lavage if there is a lot of bleeding present. 
and uh, of course we know all of us are using it as a preoperative tool for uh, large fibrovascular proliferations before we do the surgery so but of course you are not going to believe me and just start doing uh, using antivege for pdr but best practice would be to examine the research of the evidence available in the literature and then decide for yourself so let us look at very briefly and very quickly at what evidence we have so far there is a large body of evidence available for ranibizumab in PDR and if you look at protocol S, uh, the conclusion of protocol S that it supports ranuzumab as a viable treatment for uh, PDR and uh, even with whether patient has DME or no DME, uh, despite that the, the PDR patients did show good improvement. Uh, in rise and ride also they looked at the severity of diabetic retinopathy and there was nearly two step or three step improvement in the severity of diabetic retinopathy scale with ranibizumab. And this uh, nearly about 75% of patients achieved this improvement in one year and this improvement was stable, clinically noticeable and uh, maintained for nearly three years. Uh, uh, the, 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 there was a three times reduction in new NV formation in these patients who were treated with ranibizumab. And in protocol, I also looked at ranibizumab along with uh, uh, PRP and they also showed that there was a reduced risk of uh, diabetes retinopathy progression when uh, ranibizumab was added. So here you can see compared to the other arms that is laser or uh, triamcinolone, there was a good uh, control of diabetic retinopathy when the patients were treated with ranibizumab alone or along with PRP. In Proteus study, uh, again it was shown that ranibizumab along with PRP uh, led to good regression of uh, neovascularization process with maintaining visual acuity. Uh, the, the area of the neovascularization process was seen to regress nearly 92% of patients when the ranibizumab was added. About five, nearly 50% of patients showed complete regression of NV and this time to regression was nearly halved when the ranibzumab was added along with uh, PRP. Uh, this PRIDE study also looked at uh, ranibzumab with or without uh, PRP and it, uh, again that also showed there was a good regression with uh, reduced leakage from NV when ranibzumab was added. And there was a, a meta-analysis also available looked at again uh, role of ranibzumab in various, uh, various treatments for PDR and nearly 15 studies were included in this meta-analysis and the meta-analysis also stated that the best effect on vision was uh, seen when ranibzumab was added as a treatment option for PDR. There was a good change of uh, control of uh, central retinal thickness when ranibzumab was added along with PRP. And overall the adverse reactions of PRP were reduced when ranibzumab was added. And this is the forest plot which shows that there is a favorable uh, 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 outcome for ranibzumab either alone or along with PRP. But what is the strategy when to combine anti -VEGF? whether we should do anti first followed by PRP or whether we should do PRP first or followed by anti -VEGF? and there is a study for that also. Uh, so if you look at this study, it showed that ranibzumab first followed by PRP shows better outcomes uh, and it is of course, uh, you, you can definitely agree with that because the ranibzumab will reduce the load, or load of anti -VEGF, reduce the diabetic retinopathy severity and it reduces the energy required for PRP. Uh, it gives good reduction in the central macular thickness and the additional treatments that we normally do is also reduced with uh, ranibizumab. So to summarize, I would say that diabetic retinopathy is a major burden, health burden uh, we are facing nowadays. Although PRP is good, a gold standard, we all agree that is a good treatment, but addition of an anti vegf can give us further added benefit along with uh, a PRP and anti vegf can be added in certain clinical situations which I just enumerated. And uh, so ranibizumab followed by PRP is a good viable option for treatment of PDR. And thank you so much for your kind attention. Ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Anand, I'll move to you directly. Being quiet for some time. Um, what do you, t uh, I, I'll move to DME first. Let me be very specific. DME patient, little well off, intelligent, well off patient, intelligent, C18, 612, OCT definite. Uh, two questions directly to you. Uh, keep in mind what Dr. Dinesh kept saying some role of laser, some leak here and there, and with your experience, put in your contact lens, you see something. Do you at any point advise nowadays any FA initially? Keep in mind that you would like to do a focal edge at some point. So, uh, question I think now uh, most uh, OCD, uh, you know, have OCD angiography. So, uh, I presume. That's 618 vision, and therefore I'd have a clear view of the macula. I would do almost all my cases, uh, both DME and AMD, get an octa done. So that tells me that's, that's good enough to tell me if there is any macular ischemia. That, that's my primary overriding concern. 
and the aneurysm. So I, to begin with, since I, I'm presuming this is, you know, naive patient and starting off, definitely go in early with anti-VEGF. Uh, according so, to, so when you, yeah. when you counsel your patients again, uh, okay, let's assume finance is not an issue. Uh, do you tell them next four to six months you'll be on a monthly checkup? What do you, what do you counsel your yeah, patients? Yeah, so that's the first thing I, I most important thing, I think one of the important takeaways from Dr. Talwar's talk and what we've learned from a lot of these trials is that diabetic macular edema especially is a beast that you have to get a good grip on early. You do get a good grip on that early with good anti-VEGF uh, and ranuzumab and he's detailed uh, <coughs> regions where, you know, if it's very good equity, then all three work. If it's poorer equity, then eflipizumab and ranuzumab work equally well and definitely they're superior to uh, bevacizumab. So either of those two options uh, going forwards. And I would have to impress upon him that he needs to come in regularly, possibly monthly, and uh, also that he would need a number of injections first year. And the, if he complies with that, then it is very likely that the number of injections do, later do, do, will Do you reduce. throw the numbers at the patient, this many injections, yes, yes, this yes. many months? I mean, if the patient is, like you said, educated, informed and all that, I would have this conversation with them. I think the best way to treat a patient is by involving them in their own treatment and make, uh, educating them about the science. But also importantly, to tell him that what you didn't mention to me is how well controlled he is. I think that's an important overriding. I'm, I'm leaving that power for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just saying. I'm, um, we'll shift you. Uh, at what point do you consider switching, and I'll make it very outright, to Ozudex? Second, third injection, something not happening. You know, and let's assume that patient is well controlled. I'm assuming those parts are okay. Good follow up. At what point do you feel, okay, I'll go for Ozudex? Assuming that the patient is well controlled, and uh, so I normally give three injections as a loading dose because I firmly believe in loading dose. After that, also, if the patient does not have a good response, then I would consider switching to Ozudex. Uh, are you a, do you consider a fake status as a no-no or you're okay with the Farron Ozodex? No, I am okay with Ozodex even in fake patients. I just need to explain to the patient that there is a chance of developing Animal chance a, of yeah, cataract. Right. And I agree is fine. Before I move on, um, the next session, we understand. Uh, you, uh, that we assume, we accept NVI, NVG, all those patients have uh, anti-VEGF. There's one corner which said good compliance. So are you able to convince your patients or Anand, uh, you ma'am first? What is this small category where clean eye, some NVE, no DME? I'm, I'm telling you again, I repeat, no DME. Do you start with anti vegf Do you give them the option? First of all, it is very rare to get a patient like this who has just a small NVE and nothing else and also is very intelligent and is likely to follow up and get good injections. So it's very difficult to get such a patient. But uh, uh, that, that scenario is there. If you do happen to have such a patient, then you can uh, probably try an anti of monotherapy. But most of the Indian patients are not good candidates for this anti of monotherapy at all. And I would not uh, primarily advocate that as a first treat treatment option. Definitely PRP should be the first treatment option. But some patients, uh, yeah, supposing patient is... Uh, not willing for laser or debilitated, but the anti of option is there. But most of the patients are very poor, uh, you know, follow patients. So after first injection, they may never turn I was just trying to the audience that it's an option, but keep it low in your priority. PRP would again go ahead and at the add-on, uh, anti of at some point re-bleeds with him, well controlled. In those patients, you can add on one injection here, here and there, but that is not the mainstay of what we are doing. I'll have uh, one user, then Sangeet, and we'll stop after that. Uh, I believe monotherapy for PDR, like catching the tiger by the tail. Got it, then you, you can't leave it. Better alternative is to add PRP along with an anti vegf Results of a combination therapy are probably the best that you can get in terms of resolution of the disease process. So in patients who have a flat neovascularization, I would give an anti vegf and complete the PRP. As the patients who have a study group to do a study on that. Yes, on patients, yeah, so you can do that for the next year. Those who have raised neovascularization, I'd probably prefer to have ERP first and consider uh, adding VEGF later. One last comment from Dr. Sangeet Mantel, we close the session. Of that. I just, I wanted to know, uh, if a patient has PDR and DME, both, and you are treating the patient with monthly injections, so then also you need a laser? Okay. Yeah, absolutely, I think definitely. Yeah. There are two separate uh, diseases, of course, the different manifestations, but I think PRP is an absolute mandate, the primary treatment for uh, somebody who has had it. Even 
question for that up is, with, uh, uh, if you have a loss to follow up, any loss to follow up, nothing toward will happen. PDR loss to follow up after your monotherapy you may end up with a patient coming back with either a traction detachment or a vitreous. Uh, the patient is already on monthly injection. He's coming. That's why I said that the patient coming for the monthly injection has come for the first and the second, and after the third, he disappears for one year. He will come back with severe PDR, almost like a bang. That's so it's better to complete the laser while you have a chance. Are legal implications also. In that case, uh, you will give one injection, do the laser, or you give uh, three injections and then do the laser. Uh, after the first, after the first injection, or maybe the second, eat the laser. We will stop that here. For the next session, please. Thank you so much. Back to thank all the speakers and panelists, Dr. Anand Rajendran, Dr. Dinesh Thank you.